Hey everybody, this is Matt Atkinson, and you're watching Four Gettysburg with Aaron Smith. What is going on, everybody? Thank you so, so much for joining me today. As always, this is Aaron Smith, your favorite bald-headed, bearded historian, coming at you with another great video on an awesome, interesting, fascinating Civil War topic. I am again taking a break from the Gettysburg battlefield, and I'm discussing today one of the most fascinating individuals in all of American history. I am talking about John Brown. Behind me stands the Kennedy Farmhouse, the house that John Brown will use as a base for his raid on Harper's Ferry, but our story doesn't start there. Before I get into it all, I want to thank you guys from the bottom of my heart for joining me today, for all the support of the channel. If you would have told me I would be where I was at at this point when I first started, I wouldn't have believed you. So thank you guys so much so much for all the support for all your comments all your feedback positive and negative I, I get a laugh out of the negative comments just as much as i appreciate the positive comments so if you guys are enjoying the video if you guys are enjoying the channel please remember to subscribe on average only about 10 to 25 percent of everyone that watches a video is subscribed so please make sure you guys check it out so you get updated so you can see more of the awesome content that i put out almost every single week again thank you guys so so much the story of john brown starts in 1800 when he's born in kentucky but the real story of john brown starts when he's 12 years old John Brown is going to witness the brutal beating of an eight-year-old slave boy nearby where he grew up. And this is going to firmly, firmly affect John Brown. He's going to quickly realize, young in his life, that slavery is an absolute evil that must be eradicated. Now, as John Brown gets older, he is going to become a businessman, but he's not going to be a very good businessman. Several of his businesses are going to fail. He gets into the wool business, the tannery business, all kinds of things like that in the, in the early to mid 1800s, but most of them are going to fail. It's not until the 1850s when one of John Brown's sons goes to Kansas. Now, during the time there's the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Kansas was going to be a free state or a slave state based on popular sovereignty. So the pro-slavery people, they were trying to get as many pro-slavers into Kansas as possible. And now we had the free soilers or the free staters. They too were trying to get as many people into Kansas as possible. And of course, at this time in America's history, the number one most divisive topic was slavery. Now in 1834, you had Nat Turner's uh, slave rebellion in which Nat Turner killed nearly 60 white men, including an infant. That was still very fresh on people's mind. That scared a lot of people. So here we have John Brown's son going into Kansas and he soon sends a letter to John Brown saying what we need are men and guns and supplies. So John Brown soon packs up and moves to Kansas. Now, shortly after John Brown's in Kansas, there's going to be an attack on an abolitionist settlement of Lawrence, Kansas, in which several people are killed. Not only that, but Senator Sumner in the United States Senate is going to be beaten nearly to death for his pro abolitionist views. This angers John Brown. This incenses John Brown. So John Brown and several of his sons. Now, mind you, John Brown was very busy. He had two wives in his lifetime, nearly 20 children. So John Brown and several of his sons and several other men, they're going to form a posse and they're going to go around in the evening of May 24th into the morning, early morning hours of May 25th. And they're going to drag men out of their homes. They're essentially going to knock on their door. Do you support slavery? Are you an abolitionist? The pro-slavers would be dragged out to their front lawn. They're no doubt their families watching in horror 
and the men would be struck down with broadswords, a type of, of, of wide sword, short sword, almost like a Roman gladius. They would be struck down on their front lawns in view of their family. And John Brown and his posse of men are going to kill five men in what is known as the Potawatomi Massacre. This massacre sends shockwaves not only through Kansas, which at this point has entered the bleeding Kansas phase, the bleeding Kansas co conflict, one of the bloodiest conflicts that are directly leading up to the American Civil War. Not only does it send shockwaves through all of Kansas, but this sends shockwaves through the nation. Overnight, John Brown becomes a household name. Some people celebrate John Brown as a hero for abolitionism. Other people call him a terrorist. Now, after the Potawatomi massacre, John Brown and his posse of men, the Potawatomi rifles, they're going to be involved in several smaller conflicts, fighting with these pro-slavery men. And, and, and it's going to be a bloody back and forth, a, a microcosm of the larger bloody Kansas conflict, which in itself resulted in 200 confirmed deaths and probably many, many hundreds more as a result of this action and this conflict taking place in Kansas in the 1850s. Now, John Brown, he's not one to rest on his laurels. He is a deeply devout religious man. He was known for going into prayers that lasted hours and hours. John Brown believes he has a righteous cause. John Brown is going to eradicate slavery in the United States by any means necessary, even if it comes to violence. So, after the Potawatomi Massacre of 1856, John Brown, he is going to go into action. He is going to start to connect with a lot of these very, very big, influential abolitionists. He's going to meet with Frederick Douglass. He is going to meet with Harriet Tubman. He is going to become incredibly well connected. And during this time, he starts to plan his ultimate goal, the abolition of slavery in America. John Brown, he spends some time up in New England, and it's there in New England that he proposes this idea to several abolitionists who then support his idea. The Secret Six, these six influential abolitionists, the Secret Six, they're going to provide material support, moral support, and financial support to John Brown's ultimate plan. And John Brown's ultimate plan is this. John Brown's ultimate plan is to capture the United States armory at Harper's Ferry, the largest armory in the United States at the time. Nearly 100,000 guns are stored there. He is going to take captive the armory, and he is going to then free slaves all along the Appalachian Mountain Corridor. He is going to create an insurrection. He's going to arm these slaves, and he is going to abolish slavery by force. Now, as I said, as John Brown is preparing for this ultimate attack on Harper's Ferry, preparing to create this insurrection in what was known in what was Virginia at the time, he is making all sorts of connections throughout the abolitionist community. Like I said, he gets in tight with Frederick Douglass, even lives with him for a period of a few months. He gets in tight with a lot of the abolitionists up in Boston and New England, and he's even going to hold an abolitionist convention in Chatham, Canada. And during this convention, he is going to create a provisional constitution and he is going to be elected commander-in-chief of the forces. However, with the enthusiasm on the first day of this convention, when it came time to elect the other posts in this constitution, very few people stood up and volunteered. Even fewer people would join him finally at Harper's Ferry in this house behind me, the Kennedy Farmhouse. John Brown and about 20 other men, plus two of his daughters, one daughter-in-law and his, his true blood daughter, Annie, are going to join him in this house. And they're going to use this house as a covert base of operations to plan and scope out 
Harper's Ferry and the United States Armory. One of his men, John Cook, is going to go into Harper's Ferry and he's actually going to, in, in a few short months, become a very well-respected man in the community. He's going to make a lot of connections in Harper's Ferry, but the ultimate plan is truly just to find information and to get in well with the locals. So as you can imagine, 20 men plus two women plus John Brown hiding out in this small farmhouse behind me. It is going to arise suspicion and it does arise suspicion from the neighbors. So John Brown comes up with a clever ruse that he is a mineral prospector, that he is simply here to, uh, you know, check out the soil and see if there's any, you know, valuable minerals in the soil and, and this type of thing. And it's even said that John Brown could be seen, you know, on the front porch looking at rocks and soil samples and stuff. So he really, really was playing into this ruse that he had going so as not to arise suspicion from the neighbors. However, at the time, John Brown is receiving shipments and shipments of guns and pikes and, and all sorts of supplies and arms from Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, and all these shipments coming to this small house, no doubt makes the neighbors suspicious. So eventually the men would have to hide out during the day and what's described as just incredible boredom. They would play cards, read the Bible, write letters, all this sort of things, and, they, and they'd be active during the night. And they would train during the night as well. In fact, thunderstorms were a godsend to them in those summer months from July to October 1859 when they hit out and used this house as a base of operations because the thunderstorms, the, the thunderclaps would create this sort of disguise of the noise of them training with rifles and pistols and muskets. So then, in the afternoon, of October 16, 1859, John Brown, 16 white men, some of them his sons, his very own blood, and five men of color, some freed slaves, some slaves on the run. They will make their fateful raid on the armory at Harper's Ferry. Said earlier, John Brown's attack can really be summed up as a suicidal mission. And Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman told him exactly that. We support your charisma, we support you know the idea behind it, but it's suicide, John Brown. It's never gonna work. Nonetheless, John Brown was still determined to free the slaves here in Virginia. Now, currently I'm standing on the grounds of the United States Armory at Harper's Ferry. Modern day West Virginia, now of course back then in 1859, this was Virginia. And like I said, this was the largest armory in the United States. It was also an arsenal, nearly 100,000 guns were kept here. That was a very, very tempting target for John Brown. So October 16th, John Brown strikes. And that night, sadly enough, the first victim of John Brown's raid is going to be a freed black man. Haywood Shepard. He was a railman working on the railroad that night for the Baltimore and Ohio. A contingent of John Brown's men, they took the railroad bridge and they saw Haywood Shepard, but it was dark. They couldn't see who he was. And tragically, he was the first man to die in John Brown's raid. Ironically, a raid designed to free the slaves. So John Brown's men, they take the armory with very little to no resistance and they make the engine house, a type of headquarters for the armory. Men spread throughout the armory. In fact, men spread throughout all of Harper's Ferry. John Brown thought that Harper's Ferry was a defensible position. If you could hold the bridges in and out of town, you could hold the town itself. Meanwhile, other men went out to the country countryside to try and free slaves to join the cause. Now with them, they had about 950 pikes, which is like a small spear, uh, kind of an elongated stick with a dagger at the end of it. John Brown didn't want to give the freed slaves muskets initially because a musket at the time was a rather complex weapon to use. However, John Brown realized that if you give a man a weapon, especially a freed slave, 
That is power. He is going to empower them. So that's why they have these very archaic weapons with them, these pikes. It's better than nothing. John Brown's men take the armory. Now, that train with Hayward Shepard tragically killed, that train is going to be released by John Brown's men two hours after the capture of the town, after the capture of the armory. And that train is going to go into station and is going to telegraph immediately, send it across the entire country that the armory at Harper's Ferry is under attack. Now, those reports were inaccurate. They said John Brown had 200 men. Some estimates were even as high as 500 men. In reality, it was 22 men, including Brown himself. And this gets everybody on high alert. By that next morning, the entire town is filled with militias and now we have fighting in the streets. These houses behind me are going to be filled with militiamen taking pot shots at Brown's men in the armory. Now these militias were less an organized fighting force and more of a mob with guns. Now remember, at the time, Nat Turner's slave revolt is still very, very fresh in the mind. That was only about 20, 25 years earlier. So with this in mind and hearing that John Brown, the famed radical abolitionist, is in town with an army of freed slaves taking the armory, you can only imagine that these mob you know these mobs these these militias they were out for blood so they're taking pot shots at brown's men eventually james buchanan is going to order a contingent of the marines nearby into harper's ferry and the man that led those marines the highest ranking army official closest to the scene robert e lee Eventually, these militia mobs are going to force Brown's men to consolidate into the engine house. And the reason I'm not filming at the engine house, though we are going to see some shots of that here shortly, is that the location of the engine house today is not where it was originally located. There's a monument on the hill just over this direction that is the original location of John Brown's fort, as that engine house at the armory is going to be called. So his men are going to consolidate into this engine house. But at this point, John Brown has lost a lot of men. So during the fighting on the 17th of October, 1859, Six civilians will be killed, eight militiamen wounded, another nine civilians wounded. These streets would be ablaze with fire popping off from the armory to the houses on the hillside back to the armory. Finally, John Brown's men condensed here at the site, this monument marking the original site of what would later become known as John Brown's Fort. Now, early in the morning, late in the evening of October 17th, early morning, October 18th, the Marines would arrive, about 90 Marines. A contingent of 20 of them would surround the fort. Now, Robert E. Lee commanding, he will send Lieutenant James Yule Brown Stewart under a white flag of truce to negotiate with John Brown for his immediate surrender. John Brown tells Stewart his terms and doesn't mince his words. The immediate abolition of slavery and he will surrender. Jeb Stewart cannot accept those terms. So at this point, John Brown and his men, what few survivors are left, are holed up in the armory. Jeb Stewart came and peeped open the door and tried to negotiate their surrender. John Brown refused. So now about 20 Marines under Isaac Green, totally under Robert E. Lee, they try to bang down these doors. And these are thick doors, it's, it's not working for them. So they later grab a ladder as a battering ram. And they ram open the doors and 
see John Brown and his men and several of the hostages inside and one Marine will be wounded, stabbed. John Brown himself will be stabbed several times, most of the blows being deflected by a belt buckle, a very lucky belt buckle. Wounded, captured, the raid on the armory over, John Brown will be sent to Charlestown, West Virginia to be jailed and await trial. Now John Brown was captured and he was imprisoned at Charlestown at the county seat of Jefferson County here in Virginia at the time. And several prominent abolitionists funded and sent lawyers, powerful lawyers, intelligent lawyers to John Brown's aid. They wanted him to plead insanity. Clearly a man that would attack a United States government institution, especially one as vital to the nation as the United States Armory at Harper's Ferry, clearly the man was insane. His own, his, own, uh, his own peers thought he was insane. Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, you know, some of the most well-known abolitionists and, and, and movers and shakers on the Underground Railroad, they thought he was insane, but John Brown had his wits about him. And when he was handed down his charges, treason, attempting an insurrection, all these charges, which the maximum penalty being death, John Brown said that he was not insane, and he realized that if the state of Virginia hung him, his raid was not in vain. Even though it wasn't successful, even though he wasn't able to cause the insurrection that he so, so much desired to cause and, and escape into the Appalachian Mountains and move down south and continue freeing the slaves, John Brown realized that if they hung him, they would make him a martyr for the cause of abolitionism. And so the trial came and went, and it sensationalized the newspapers across the country. Slave insurrection put down in Harper's Ferry, Virginia. John Brown was found guilty and sentenced to hang in Charlestown, Virginia, just a few miles outside of Harper's Ferry, where his raid happened and his raid failed said that as John Brown approached the gallows there on that fateful day in September, a quick trial nonetheless, the hanging in mid-December, he passed a letter to one of his jailers. And in that letter, really more of a small note, scribbled out on some paper in his jail cell, John Brown said, to the effect as legend goes, I, John Brown, am now fully convinced that the sins of this land can only be purged by blood. Perhaps John Brown was less of a martyr and more of a prophet, because two years later, the bloodiest conflict in American history, which resulted in the, the changing and loss of some 600,000 lives and millions more in fields in Pennsylvania and, and farms in Virginia, family homesteads in Georgia and Tennessee, and small towns in Maryland, the United States Civil War would be sparked, no doubt in part, to John Brown's actions here at Harper's Ferry. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me today on this episode of Forward Gettysburg. Again, we are on the road at Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, would have been Virginia at the time of the Civil War. This is an awesome town. I love the history and guys, I love John Brown. I think he's such a fascinating figure. In fact, I'm uh, wearing a John Brown shirt. My wife hates it, but I love it. <laughs> in fact, uh, funnily enough, we took a trip here together and uh, I was into it, went to the Wax Museum, and every, every little building here is, is some type of small little museum in and of itself. And by the end of the day, my wife said, Aaron, if you mention John Brown one more time, I will divorce you. Uh, luckily, we are still together, despite my appreciation of history and uh, love for John Brown here. I just find him a fascinating, fascinating figure in American history, an American hero, still very divisive, still very influential. Um, it, it's impossible train going by. It happens here quite often. But it's nearly impossible to to compare it to something today. People try to compare it to the 
uh, you know, the abortion debate, the immigration debate, but it, but it's impossible. It was, slavery was such a divisive issue. It's, it's unlike anything our nation has ever seen. Imagine those Trump years just magnified by a multitude of hundreds of thousands, and that's where we're at with the slavery debate. And, and John Brown literally was the powder keg that set off the Civil War two years later after his raid. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining me. Had a lot of fun filming this episode. Again, I apologize. My microphone, my little wireless mic, the uh, dongle that hangs out of the camera, uh, fell over and snapped off in, in the wet, windy weather here. So I do apologize for that. But nonetheless, I appreciate you guys joining me. Please, if you're enjoying the content, enjoying the channel, enjoying these on the road episodes, please remember to like and subscribe to the channel. And as always, I'm your host, Aaron Smith, and I will catch you on the next one.